All right, so we hit around 400 participants. Um, people are still trickling in, but I think this is a good good point to get started. So good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or good evening, or whatever time it may happen to be, wherever you are. Um, I'm really excited to be presenting um, and introducing our first um, Tiny ML talk session. So um, you may be familiar with the Tiny ML organization who organized the Tiny ML Summit and the Tiny ML series of meetups. Um, we started out with a summit here in the um, San Francisco Bay Area, um, and we've been running regular meetups here for a while, and we have some other meetup groups starting. But with the, the current events, we thought it would be really awesome if we could um, start up a series of online talks and let people hear from leaders in the Tiny ML space, wherever they are in the world. So thank you so much for coming to our first session. Um, my name is Daniel Sitanayaka. Um, I work as the founding Tiny ML engineer at Edge Impulse, and we build tooling to make it easy for embedded developers to build ML applications. Um, and uh, I'm just here this morning to introduce Pete Warden, who's going to be our speaker. So more from Pete in a moment. Um, so first of all, I wanted to say that um, we are looking for sponsors for this series of talks. There's going to be a talk once every two weeks. And if you're interested and you'd like your logo up here, um, we uh, recommend you chat with Betty, so you can reach Betty at betty at tinyml.org for more info. So our next talk is going to be on April 14th, and it's going to be from Sek Chai, who is the CTO and founder of Latent.ai. So that should be really exciting. The topic is adaptive AI for a smarter edge. Um, all of our talks are going to start at 8 a.m. Pacific time and go for about 30 minutes. And if you are interested in presenting, we would love to hear from you. So please just drop us an email at talks at tinyml.org. Um, so as well as being broadcast, the talks are all going to be made available online the day after. So um, there's a, a good chance to reach a bunch of people. So next and finally from me, I'd like to introduce Pete Warden. So, I had the amazing luck of getting to work with Pete Warden during my time at Google, um, where he leads the TensorFlow efforts around mobile and embedded. Um, and Pete started the TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers effort at Google, um, which you probably are aware um, is Google's effort to basically bring deep learning down to the embedded level. Um, so Pete generally deserves not too much introduction, so I will hand over to him right now and I'm really excited to see his presentation this morning. Great, thanks so much Dan and if you give us a couple of seconds to get the uh, screen sharing working. Um... So while Pete does that um, I'll mention we're, we're having a really interactive session today. Um, if you have questions please post them in the Q&A, um, the Q&A widget that is part of the um, uh, Zoom equipment. Um, I'll also be relaying some questions that um, we received on the forum and via email. So um, if you have new questions, drop them in the Q&A and we will answer them. And uh, otherwise, uh, enjoy Pete's presentation. <laughs> awesome. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, and hi, everyone. Uh, it's uh, fantastic uh, to see such a great turnout. Um, and I have asked Dan to interrupt me with questions of his own or questions as they come up as we go through this. Uh, really, these slides are just um, kind of an excuse to have a QA. So <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing what everybody has to say. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about is just the bare bones uh, pointers on how you as a developer can get started uh, with this whole tiny ML thing. Um, let's see, the first thing I want to emphasize is it feels really weird to be talking about um, technology at a time when the world's going through this kind of uh, pandemic. Um, I want to encourage everyone to uh, think of their own, you know, safety uh, first. Um, everything that I'm talking about will still be relevant. Uh, when we hopefully emerge. Um, so one really nice thing about this talk is it's being recorded. Um, so, <laughs> uh, you know, if, if you're having trouble uh, focusing, um, that's 
completely normal. All of us are. Um, so don't worry if it's, if it's not really, um, you know, you're not really absorbing this. Um, that is, that is completely normal. Um, but having said all that, um, lockdown is not only, um, kind of horrifying, it's also really boring. Um, so I was actually excited to have this chance to talk about something that I'm really interested in. Um, and that uh, I love spending time on, um, and I'm hoping that it will actually provide a distraction uh, for some of you as well. Um, it really is a, one of the most interesting things that I know about um, in terms of technology at the moment, so that's a big reason why I'm excited about talking about this. And you should be able to do everything that I'm talking about um, through things that you can fairly simply order online and use through sort of a web connection. Um, so one nice aspect of this is you don't really need to go outside uh, to um, give some of this stuff a try. So what I'm aiming to do at the end of this uh, short talk is give you some pointers on how you can actually get started with real world, concrete, practical, um, embedded machine learning projects. Uh, I really want to show you how you can start building your own devices um, really without very much coding at all, um, definitely no soldering, um, and definitely no PhD, uh, which is lucky because I don't have one myself. Um, so it's really about just trying to give you the tools you need to be able to uh, make some progress on this. Um, one question that definitely came up um, in the forums um, and comes up every time I'm talking about this is really what is TinyML? Um, because one thing we talk about is running machine learning on embedded systems, but embedded systems can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, some people think about Raspberry Pis as embedded systems, for example. Um, or NVIDIA Jetsons, um, and they are embedded systems, but they're not the main focus of what we're doing because things really change. The capabilities really change once you start to get into really low energy usage. Um, once you start to get below one milliwatt, what that opens up is the possibility that you can have uh, small devices that are powered on a coin battery that can last for months or years um, and potentially can use energy harvesting. Um, and they become radically easier to deploy than things that you either need to change the batteries on or plug into the wall. So the working definition we have of TinyML is, hey, can you do machine learning at below one milliwatt? Um, now, that's still an ambitious target uh, we are able to do that with some of the uh, devices I'll be talking about, um, but we do stretch that definition to include things that use tens of milliwatts at the moment, just because some of those are a lot easier to work with and a lot easier to program. But we're always keeping our eye on that application domain where you can have something that runs on batteries or coin harvesting for, or energy harvesting for a long time. So, so Pete, just to uh, yes. sort of connect that with one of the questions we got through on our forum um, was, uh, can you discuss the differences between tiny ML and GPU powered edge devices like the Google Coral and Jetson Nano? So it sounds like you're saying that tiny ML devices are sort of a, a order of magnitude smaller than those types of platforms. Exactly. I don't know. I don't have the exact figures, but I know that, um, for example, the Jetson uh, boards, they use up to 10 watts of power. Um, and that would drain even a phone battery um, in a matter of like, you know, probably under an hour, in, uh, at most an hour or two. So that's something that you have to kind of keep plugged in. You have to keep changing uh, the battery on. Um, now the Edge TPU is more efficient it's actually, I think, uh, somewhere around 500 milliwatts, uh, you know, give or take. 
but even 500 milliwatts is a significant, if you were running that on your phone um, continuously, um, your battery wouldn't last uh, for too long. So uh, that's, that's really the fundamental thing we, we think about and like the big difference between just running this on something that's a physical device out there in the world which is sort of the embedded idea versus running on something that is kind of this untethered device that you can just kind of put anywhere and leave and it will just do its job without any human intervention, which is really what we're looking for. Excellent. Thank you. Cool. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, first, what kind of hardware can you use to develop um, prototype uh, applications? Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is uh, the Arduino Nano. Um, and if you can see my little screen, um, I've actually got one that I've duct taped to a magic wand here. Um, and this is um, a really nice device uh, because it's very easy to program. Um, the Arduino IDE supports it as kind of a first class citizen. Um, and I'll talk later about how we actually have the TensorFlow library included uh, as part of the Arduino IDE. I think it's around uh, $30. Um, and one thing that all of these boards have in common that I'm going to be talking about is that they have um, sensors like microphones and accelerometers uh, built in. So you don't have to do any wiring or um, anything particularly special in order to get the kind of sensors you need to build uh, these tiny ML applications. Um, as I mentioned, we're kind of stretching the definition of tiny ML a little bit because this is taking tens of milliwatts of power. Uh, I don't have exact figures, but it's not in the sort of one milliwatt range. So you're going to not be able to sort of leave this unattended for months or years on any reasonable kind of battery. Um, but at least it's a way of sort of you can prototype things in a pretty small form factor um, and you know, actually get stuff up and running um, really easily. Um, now, if you are looking at something that can actually be powered by a coin battery and is only using sort of one or two milliwatts, um, the Sparkfront Edge Board uh, is a really nice um, alternative. Uh, it's using a Cortex M4 uh, CPU from Ambic, uh, which is actually using a special technology, which means it can uh, it can run in below one milliwatt. Um, and as I'll talk about, um, there's even things like camera support with some really low power cameras uh, that use only um, you know about a milliwatt for the camera interface and actually supporting the camera. Um, and it has a really nice small form factor, has a battery slot in the back, uh, in the back of it. Um, and there's Arduino support is, um, is in progress. Um, you can use the Arduino and we're, um, we're working with SparkFun to keep improving that. Um, another board I want to call out is uh, Adafruit have been doing a fantastic job um, having a very full featured uh, board with a lot of um, uh, peripherals like this actually comes with its own screen um, and it's been used as a conference badge uh, which is really nice um, and you can plug in a, a microphone um, and it's got lots of buttons and accelerometers and things like that um, and it has uh, support for I think a LiPo uh, rechargeable battery um, and is also programmable through um, Arduino as well. Um, so if you want something where you can actually debug it through looking at a display, um, this is a really nice alternative. Um, though it is a bit sort of larger as you can see in the photo. Um, so you're not, you're not going to easily be able to kind of stick it on a magic wand uh, like I can with uh, this, this little fella. Um, now, if you really want to get into sort of the industrial design type stuff, there's um, the uh, poetically named STM32F746G 
uh, discovery board um, from SD Micro. Um, and this is um, packed full of all sorts of ports and peripherals, as you can see. It's also really energy hungry. Um, you're looking at hundreds of milliwatts um, and it's super big. So it's like the size of a smartphone. So you're not going to be, um, you know, sort of uh, using it as a peel and stick sensor um, anywhere easily. But it does have um, great support through embed. Um, and we do, um, as I'm going to mention, support this and all of the other boards I mentioned um, as part of TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. Um, if you're ordering one of these, um, hopefully you have a USB micro cable um, sitting around. Um, but if you don't, uh, make sure that you um, order one um, and you're going to need um, some kind of laptop. You might be able to get away with a Chromebook on the Arduino side, but it's a bit fiddly. Otherwise, um, most of these use Arduino, so you can use Mac, Linux, or Windows uh, laptops uh, or desktops uh, with these. Um, and that should be all the hardware that you actually need to get started. All right, and, Pete, so before yeah. we uh, move on, we had a bunch of hardware questions from the oh, yeah. audience. So um, let me do these in sort of random order. Um, so uh, one of them, one of the questions was, will an ESP32 work instead of a Nano33 BLE for testing the basics? Uh, yes, yeah, we've actually been working closely with Espressive on um on supporting that and we we have um support i believe for most of the examples um i'm just uh one of the things we've done with the arduino is we've actually made it so that you can just use um you can just download the project through their library manager in the arduino ide um, I'm kind of holding off on saying we've got full support for the ESP32 until it's as drop dead simple as the Arduino um, process. Um, so I'm working, we're working towards just having a downloadable library where you don't have to use any of our convoluted makefile stuff. Um, you can just use the sort of, I think it's the IDF.py uh, stuff that you get with the expressive toolkit. Um, so I'm hoping that we actually are able to get that out in the next um, in the next few weeks. But you can already, if you're willing to do a little bit of self-assembly, um, uh, use it. If you just look in the examples folder for like Hello World and look for ESP32, you should find instructions there. All right, thank you, Pete. Um, so next question was, um, how do we define power consumption? Um, is it only based on the ML running on the MCU or is it also the sensors? And how do we quantify this um, if we're trying to do some benchmarking? So honestly, the simplest way I found to quantify this is set up something to be battery powered and run it until it's dead. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of other ways um, that somebody much smarter than me and with much more of an electrical engineering background can do using multimeters um, and everything else. But really what most people care about is total system usage um, because that's what drains the battery. Like what we're really optimizing for is how long can this run unattended with nobody having to fuss over it um, because that's the only way that you can scale up the number of these devices beyond like, you know, the number of people. Um, so yeah, really my, my first level approximation is just, get some, you know, get a coin battery and leave it running for a week. And if it's still running at the end of the week, then you've probably got something that's fairly reasonable power usage. Perfect. Um, awesome. So then there's a couple of questions about the SparkFun Edge specifically. Um, mostly around the, uh, it's received a lot of negative reviews on SparkFun's um, review thing. Is it mature enough to use now without having too much of a headache? Um, that like the main like the issues i've had when i've been running workshops with it have been um 
there's been some challenges around the USB serial connection board rate, especially, um, has been sort of um, a continual uh, challenge. Um, it's, um, it's definitely not as plug and play as the Arduino BLE, um, but it's also the only one of these boards that actually has a form factor and has a battery um, connector and has um, the low power usage where you could actually deploy this in something that's going to be running for like weeks and months potentially. So the, at the moment, there's a bit of a trade-off between getting the energy performance and kind of the ease of use. Um, so um, I, I, yeah, I think that it's fair to, it's fair to say that there are some, you know, software challenges we're working through, um, but I'm hoping it's, it's all, I'm also hoping it's getting easier because we have some, uh, the Spark Fund team have been working very hard and we have a pull request to get full Arduino support, for example, through Spark Fun. Um, and yeah, and yeah, really apologies for anybody who's been frustrated by this. I know I'm fairly new to the embedded world myself and I've, I've ended up with, I think, all of these devices tearing out my hair quite a lot. So I, I sympathize. Yeah, and from, from my personal experience too, I've really enjoyed working with that board, but basically you have to do a, a bit of work around making sure your USB driver is the, the, the USB FTDI driver is the exact right version. And so they have some drivers available on the SparkFun site. It takes a bit of playing, but once you have it working, it works and the board is great. Um, and, and it works really well for running these types of workloads. Um, so a couple more quick questions on um, hardware. So one, uh, can we run on Node MCU or ESP8266 devices? Um, so I have seen some interesting work on Node MCU. Um, I'm not sure what the status is of that. Um, on 8266, I'm actually, uh, I'm not sure. I've only looked at the ESP32 uh, side of things and um, yeah, I'm actually not sure where we are on the 8266. Cool, okay, next one, how about OpenMV? Yes, yes, we've actually been working with the team behind OpenMV um, and they've done some fantastic work um, actually supporting uh, TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers. Um, you can actually, I think, if you, I don't have the link handy, uh, but you can find through the official OpenMV um, site that you can actually grab some things like the person detector example that we have running. Um, so uh, yeah, we're, we're excited by OpenMV. It's a really great project for bringing this kind of computer vision stuff to the, to the embedded world so awesome thanks so we have a ton more questions about like does um uh, tensorflow live work on this platform or another i'm going to answer these on the forum afterwards um and pete yeah. you can chime in there too um so let's let's move along awesome so hopefully you've got um some hardware in mind uh now you actually need some software to run on this um now since i'm the tech lead for tensorflow light for microcontrollers um I'm obviously going to recommend <laughs> uh, that you use our software framework. Um, and TF Lite Micro is um, a part of the TensorFlow ecosystem. And it's a way of taking machine learning models uh, from a training environment and actually running them uh, on microcontrollers. Um, but I would like to call out um, a few different uh, projects um, I think are also, you know, fantastic um, and are well worth uh, looking at. Uh, one of them is MicroTensor um, from Neil Tan, uh, which was one of the first uh, open source machine learning projects for embedded systems. Um, and you can find it up on uh, GitHub. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, they've done some great work on that. It's well worth checking out. Uh, I would like to call out uh, Edge Impulse, uh, which is uh, the company that the startup that Dan is now working at. Um, they have done some fantastic work actually making um, the modeling and training side very accessible 
um, and very, uh, very easy to use. Um, there's also um, a French company, I believe, that I'm not, um, haven't talked to them myself, but I've seen them doing some really interesting work around uh, predictive maintenance and industrial applications um, and machine learning model modeling called uh, Cartesian. Um, and so I think they're really interesting. And I've also actually seen uh, just over the last few days, um, some other uh, stuff pop up from like the TVM group who are doing some really interesting work around binary neural networks. Um, and there's also, there's all sorts of um, really interesting projects starting to emerge. Um, so you actually have a lot of choice uh, when it comes to software. Um, so obviously I'm going to, I'm going to be pushing uh, TensorFlow Lite Micro uh, since that's what I'm working on. Um, oh, and the other thing that's interesting is like, you know, these vendors um, like ST Micro, NXP, Siva, the BSP group, a lot of them actually have their own libraries for running uh, neural networks um, on their devices. Um, and we're trying to work with them to kind of get those same optimizations into a more cross-platform system like uh, TF Lite Micro, um, but it's well worth checking out what these vendors themselves are offering for their platforms. Um, so I mentioned briefly about TF Lite Micro. Um, it's our way at Google of taking um, models that have been trained up in the cloud and actually getting them running on uh, microcontrollers and DSPs. Uh, you know, the name micro is a little bit misleading. We're doing a lot of work with Cadence on their DSPs and like the ESP32 is, you know, theoretically kind of more of a DSP um, than a, a microcontroller. Um, but really what we've aimed at is we want something that's incredibly portable, um, will run in less than 20K, doesn't rely on things like an operating system um, or memory allocation or even like C library dependencies. Um, and the nice thing is we're actually able to do this because fundamentally running neural networks is just doing math. So as long as we have like the libm uh, math library on a device, um, we're able to run um, quite happily on bare metal. Um, and a lot of the value that we offer is about taking models and actually optimizing them, like quantizing them down to eight bits, um, actually representing them in a very, very um, small and compact fashion. Um, and it's been heavily used internally uh, within Google um, for always on applications. Um, and we've been very lucky to actually be able to work with a lot of the hardware vendors out there like I mentioned ARM, um, Cadence, um, Synopsys, um, and a whole bunch more um, teams out there who are contributing optimized versions of this, uh, of the operations for uh, their own particular hardware. Um, and just to, um, you know, come back to what software you need, you don't actually need to install um, TensorFlow Lite Micro as a sort of standalone um, project. Uh, one of the reasons I've been talking about the Arduino IDE so much, which is supported by many of the boards I just discussed, is you can actually grab the um, official Arduino TensorFlow library uh, within the library manager inside the Arduino IDE. Um, now, it will only work with boards that have um, the right um, sensors built in, which is uh, basically the Arduino Nano Sense 33 BLE. Um, but the great thing about it is once you've installed it, you can just pick um, the examples um, and uh, from the normal examples folder, you can just um, you know, open them up as sketches, um, uh, build them and upload them. And you have like a zero programming way to kind of get some examples up and running on your uh, device. Um, so quick question from the audience. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, yes, no, um, please do. 
that uh, a couple of people are interested about um, the, the current TF Lite micro libraries written in C++. Um, will there be a C version of the library available? So that's, that's a good question. Um, we are using C++ and specifically C++ 11, which, you know, for the embedded world is, is quite, um, you know, it's only nine years old. Uh, so <laughs> it's actually, uh, you know, it's actually super, super recent. Um, and really a lot of that comes from the fact that we're compatible with um, this large TensorFlow Lite family that's aimed at uh, mobile devices. Um, so what it, it's definitely a, you know, it, it, ha it can be a challenge, but what we have found is that most of the devices we're aiming at are 32-bit microcontrollers or DSPs. And so they usually have comparatively modern um, compiler tool chains. And where they don't, we've been able to work with vendors to try and get them um, up and running. Um, so we haven't found it to be a blocker on any of the platforms that we want to support. Um, it would definitely be more convenient um, if we were just all in C, um, but because of the fact that we're this shared code base with uh, TensorFlow Lite for mobile, especially, and we're benefiting a lot from that, um, and that's all uh, C++, um, it's not likely that we'll be compiling as C anytime soon. Uh, we may actually offer a C interface, a C API, to make life a bit easier. Um, and if you look at most of our reference code for kernels and things, a lot of it is very C-like. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's worth calling out that we are C++. Cool, thanks, Pete. Um, so just to give you an idea of, okay, well, why are we talking about this? Like, what can you actually do with ML on these embedded devices? Um, the examples we ship with um, are things like voice recognition, just listening out for um, a wake word. I won't say the full um, Google uh, wake word because then lots of people's phones may go off. <laughs> But, you know, that's, that's the kind of application where you're running on an always-on sensor uh, that we have an example for. Uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, sort of a magic wand uh, gesture recognition uh, demo uh, that you can try out. Uh, and we also have an example of using a really low-power camera um, to try and tell when a person's nearby. So being able to wake up a device uh, when there's somebody within the camera frame is an incredibly common request from the product teams we work with. Um, and the reason we're doing this is we see all of these problems out there in the real world that we think could be helped uh, by this kind of machine learning, including things like, um, you know, health monitoring, like heartbeats, um, all in an on-device, very private way with long battery life, which is obviously important, uh, environmental, um, applications are really important too um, because you want to put stuff out into the field and kind of forget about it um, for months or years at a time. Um, and the same thing for industrial um, maintenance and devices. Um, and this is just a small selection of the kind of ideas and the products that we've seen people developing with this stuff. So I just want to give you a little bit of inspiration. Um, I, I wanted to jump in with a, a quick thought there. So what is it that um, makes an application fit tiny ML and, and edge ML? That's, that's a good question. Like, I think there's a couple of um, parts of this. Um, one of them is that you have a whole bunch of raw sensor data coming in. Like you have accelerometers or you have audio data or you have video data coming in and if you're able to make sense of it like if you're able to tell oh there's a rhino in this image or oh there's an irregular heartbeat 
or oh this machine needs uh lubrication and it's kind of you know it's going to break down if it doesn't get some um if there's some actionable information that you could glean as a sort of a person from like looking at that sensor data um that's usually a good um candidate for this sort of on device uh, ml and really the the tiny part of it is all about convenience like with a lot of these if you were able to have a big cloud you know hook up to these devices um you could just write an application in the cloud but you need a lot of power you need mains power for that fundamentally so it's all about getting away from having to change batteries or having to uh, plug in to a mains uh, power perfect thank you no problem. and then yeah just um talking about how you can actually get more information um uh me and dan <laughs> worked uh on this book uh last year uh it's about a 500 pages uh so it's it's nice and thick if you need a doorstop um it has a whole bunch of examples uh, that i mentioned um that are open source uh and we explain how to get those examples up and running um yay <laughs> dan's uh, showing it off there nice and yeah nice and thick um you can actually grab the first six chapters as a free PDF from tinymlbook.com uh, if you're interested in just sort of, you know, giving it a try uh, for free um, and just see what you think. Um, and um, you can always uh, reach me at Pete Warden on Twitter, um, or you can drop me an email uh, to petewarden at google.com uh, with sort of, you know, questions about this sort of stuff. Um, the tiny ml organization has been fantastic um ira and evgeny and olga and everybody else have been doing an, uh, and betty have been doing an amazing job um and we're going to have more meetups like this um and the forums um and there's also a uh sig micro um which uh i'll you should be able to grab these slides uh, afterwards so you'll actually be able to click on the link um, but uh, that actually has a chat room and a monthly video call for people who are actually interested in uh, the TensorFlow Lite micro software and uh, who are developing with it. Um, so uh, lots of ways uh, to try and uh, reach me. Um, and with that, I was going to sort of, you know, we've already done some questions, but I was going to hand over to Dan to uh, grill me some more. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Pete. Um, this is awesome. And um, I think we're actually sharing a uh, poll before we move on, because I know we're, we're sort of um, moving forward on time. And if anyone um, has feedback or comments about the, the TinyML talk session and the talk, um, please answer the poll that will pop up on your um, Zoom soon. Um, and uh, once you're done with that, then let's let's carry on with some questions. So Pete, I'm going to start with the, um, the question that's got the most upvotes first. So that question is from Michael and he's asking, it seems like so far the focus is uh, mostly on deep learning and neural networks. Um, are we aware of any other developments regarding ML for MCUs? So for example, for classical ML techniques rather than deep learning. Um, so things like K-nearest neighbors or random forest algorithms. Yes. Yeah. And there's been some, you know, I, I'm very focused on the deep learning side because that's my background. Um, but there has actually been some really, uh, <clears throat> good work. Um, uh, I think, uh, one of the, uh, organizations that's been doing a lot of work here is Sensi ML. Um, and they have been, uh, but there, there are a, bunch of research papers and a bunch of implementations of things like um, random forest and usually the way I think about it is deep learning is good for things that were traditionally very hard to make sense of like very noisy chaotic data so things that are kind of like audio data or 
accelerometer data or you know things that have been hard to recognize patterns in reliably with classical um, machine learning applications. Classical machine learning is usually um, a great fit when you have comparatively um, structured data, like data that you can um, make sense of in like a spreadsheet sort of thing. Um, so that's, um, you know, where a lot of my focus is on. Um, but there's a lot of room for um, really interesting work on classical ML. And we've had a, um, a bunch of contributions in the uh, Tiny ML um, Summit, uh, for example, uh, focused on this. Um, and yeah, I love, I love seeing applications around that too. Awesome. Yeah, just a quick add, like we're using um, k-means clustering in our edge impulse product for anomaly detection. So um, we're even not just using classical or deep learning, but we're using both side by side to help get the best results. So um, it definitely is something that has a, a big place here. Um, so a uh, question from Draw. Uh, hi, are there any KPIs or benchmark results that we could share regarding TensorFlow Micro? Um, that is a fantastic question. We are working uh, actually pretty actively with the ML Perf um, team, which is an academic and industrial cross organization group um, that puts out ML related benchmarks. We are actively working with them on getting some um, open source benchmarks, starting off with um, the voice recognition, the simple wait word uh, model example, and uh, moving on to some of the other examples. But we see having benchmarks out there as a really important way of driving, you know, being able to compare um, different hardware and software solutions um, and really driving the, um, driving the optimizations in the field forward. So yeah, that's, that's a big priority for us. Fantastic. Um, so here's an interesting question from Amy Nike. Um, is there a simulator which can simulate the processing power of these boards for us to get started? There is. Um, and uh, my favorite simulator uh, is actually called Renode, R-E-N-O-D-E. -E. Uh, it's an open source project from Ant Micro. Um, and it makes it pretty easy to simulate um, something like a Cortex M4 board, um, like in software running on your sort of x86 laptop. Um, we have some examples of running that in the testing. Uh, we use it for testing inside uh, like our continuous integration testing. Um, it's a little bit of work to kind of get set up <laughs> because you have to sort of we found we have to use docker at the moment um to uh get it up and running but the reno team the uh, and micro have actually been working hard to make it a lot easier um so i know that there's a more there's some new versions that are coming out that don't require you to uh, you know you don't have to worry about using docker it's more freestanding um we don't have a great tutorial ourselves on using TF Light Micro with Renode, um, but Renode itself has some good docs. So that would be my number one recommendation is uh, see if you can check out Renode and if it uh, works well for you. Um, the other thing I would say is that you can actually run all of the examples on an x86 system um, and we even, you know, most of them will run without real sensor inputs, um, but you can at least try things like the Hello World. Um, and we have done some work. If you're running on a Mac laptop, you can actually run the audio um, sensing example, and it will actually use the Mac laptop's microphone as an input, uh, which can be useful for testing. So that's another, another potential route, is you can actually just run in kind of debug mode on an x86. Excellent. Thanks, Pete. Um, so uh, a couple of questions now. So one of them is a practical question, which is, um, could we see a demo of the magic wand? Um, 
<laughs> so <laughs> I would love to give you a demo of the magic wand. It's not working as well as I'd like <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> so one of the things I've, I've actually, I, I've got a series of video um, recordings that I'm doing and I've sort of uh, stalled for the last few weeks because um, it's not doing as good a job kind of recognizing different gestures as I would like. Um, so I've actually been working internally to gather more data, uh, which is usually the answer for a lot of these ML things is just gather more data and gather better data. Um, so uh, yeah, it's like the, um, you can try, you can grab the example and try it yourself and it will kind of work. Um, but it's not nowhere near as reliable um, as I'd like. So yeah, I'm afraid I'm just going to have to tease you with the magic wand. And uh, hopefully in a, in, in a few weeks, I should actually have a release that works um, a lot more accurately. Cool. Thank you, Pete. Um, so uh, another question. So will there be a Rust library? Um, yeah, I've actually uh, seen some great work from um, the Rust world around wrapping TensorFlow Lite for um, the Raspberry Pi. Um, so uh, that has been really interesting to follow. Um, I haven't seen anything aimed at the, like, and that, so that has been more on the TensorFlow Lite mobile side. I haven't seen anything aimed at the embedded side yet. Um, but I would, I would be happy to, um, you know, offer, you know, offer consulting and, uh, well, at least advice um, and pointers to anybody who's interested in um, contributing that. Cool. Thank you. Um, and so uh, we are um, sort of running later into our session. So in the interest of time, I'm going to present our few wrap up slides. And then if it's cool with you, Pete, um, we can stick around for answering the rest of the questions after those. So that'll just take a couple of minutes. No, it sounds great. Fantastic. Okay. All right. So hopefully you, you already got a chance to take our little poll and give some feedback. Um, and if you'd like to continue the conversation after this, really definitely encourage you to head to the tiny ML forums. We have a post about um, Pete's talk and we can continue chatting. I'll definitely be hanging out there today. Um, so our next tiny ML talk is gonna be on April 14th and it's from Sek Chai. Um, apologies, the previous slide had a typo. Um, so Sek is the CTO and founder of latentai.com. Um, so that should be really awesome. I'm looking forward to our second talk in the series. Um, and so now I'll head back to Pete and uh, continue answering your questions. So um, our first question on the list right now is, is TF Lite the same as TF Lite Micro? That's a very good question. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It is pretty confusing. Um, so it uses the same file format and API and shares a lot of the code. Um, but it's a variant of TensorFlow Lite that has been uh, stripped of the things that take up a lot of um, space. So for example, we have a different, different code to run the interpreter that so it will actually fit within 20K total binary footprint. Um, so TensorFlow Lite Mobile will fit within a few hundred kilobytes. TensorFlow Lite Micro is designed to fit within like 20 kilobytes. Excellent. Um, so uh, another question is, does TensorFlow Lite perform or support network binarization? Hey, nah, yes. No, it doesn't. But there's uh, been some recent work from uh, TVM and I think it's the Octagon team um, a startup who are supporting uh, TVM um, that looks like really impressive uh, network binarization 
Um, so I just retweeted that on my twitter.com slash Pete Warden um, account if you're looking for the link. Um, but I was very excited to see that. And I hope that we can um, support finalization uh, in the future. I just wanted to call out that Twitter has been amazing as a place for learning about ML generally, but especially tiny ML. So you can get on Twitter and follow a lot of the people and companies that are doing cool stuff in this space. And there's just like awesome, cool stuff every day um, that, that you get to learn about. So I um, definitely recommend following Pete. Um, so uh, next question, can we build TF Lite for micros and run it on a standard Linux system for evaluating yes. and testing debugging? Yeah, if you actually just, um, the default is if you just grab make, uh, you grab the GitHub repo and do like make minus F with the make file and test, it will build and run all of the tests and binaries and examples um, on Linux x86. Excellent. All right. It won't, I will say though, it won't run fast um, <laughs> because we don't have any optimizations for x86. Um, but at least you'll be able to run it and debug uh, in a kind of an easier environment. All right, great. Thanks, Pete. Um, question um, for me is, are the slides going to be available in addition to the video on YouTube? I think the answer is yes, right? Yeah, cool. Yeah, I okay, think either um, it's going to make the slides available. Perfect. Um, so question from Naveen, are there any tangible plans to implement the missing ops for RNNs for TensorFlow Lite Micro? Um, and actually, yeah. could we like expand on this to talk a little bit about like what is the parity between what TensorFlow can do and what TensorFlow Lite Micro can do? Yeah, so if if you look at um, TensorFlow, um, the training framework, it has over twelve hundred operations. Um, last time I checked, um, so TensorFlow Lite for mobile, I think supports when I last looked it was in the low hundreds so like maybe 120 of uh of those ops uh you know obviously the ones that are most common and most uh, likely to be used um and then tensorflow like micro i think is somewhere around 50 ops so you have this kind of um you know concentric rings of compatibility um and we do try and support the most, you know, widely used ops, but you, you may find that, um, you know, as you're porting kind of brand new models that you run into an op that's not supported on TensorFlow Lite Micro. Um, we are continuously porting new ops over um, and we're hoping to get to parity with TensorFlow Lite, um, you know, I, I stick my neck out and say sort of in the next 12 months, you know, six to 12 months. Um, but, you know, with everything that's going on, <laughs> who can say? <laughs> Excellent. And so for those of us joining us who um, may not be super familiar with ML, like what is an op and how does that factor into your decision of what kind of model you can use and what kind of stuff you can do? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, an op is um, kind of the uh, like a layer in a network, something that does a bunch of computation, something like a convolutional layer or a fully connected layer. Um, and those are the kind of the most common um, kinds of ops, but you pretty quickly get into, um, you know, the, the thousand plus kind of ops once you start doing more exotic uh, neural networks. Um, and I think the original question was about RNNs, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so we haven't had um, super comprehensive support for RNNs in TensorFlow Lite Micro on the mobile side. Um, and I believe we're working on um, expanding that support on the mobile side. And the nice thing is that we should then inherit a lot of that in the um, TensorFlow Lite uh, for microcontrollers. You'll see we actually have um, an operator called SVDF, which is a particular kind of RNN, um, sort of in there already. It's not very easy to use from 
the open source, you know, kind of conversion side of things. And honestly, that's where a lot of the work has to go in. Is like, how do you get from an RNN that you can express in a lot of different ways in the training side um, to something that can be exported as a TensorFlow like graph? Um, cool. Thanks, Pete. So another another question. I think this is um, jumping jumping through the questions a little bit, but this is something we haven't touched on so much yet. Um, how do you recommend someone goes about training a model? on data that is emanating from sensors deployed in the field. So we've talked about models and software, but like, where do you get this data and how do you, how do you train a model based on data coming from embedded devices? Yeah. Um, and one of the most important things is to try and train on real data whenever you can. Um, so what I recommend, and we have some examples of this, um, on the Arduino side is see if you can actually write a, an embedded application that captures data directly from your sensors and then figure out how you can actually um, go ahead and label it. Um, and that is a whole, that's, I think we have some chapters on it in the book, but it, it really is its whole own world trying to gather good data and capture good data for these kinds of applications. It's really crucial and it's really, it's really a lot of hard work, so. Yeah, so to, to add to that, there are some public data sets you can use, um, so you can kind of get bootstrapped and get a head start without having to have a giant amount of data that you've collected yourself. Um, but yeah, data is always the challenge with, with ML and especially embedded ML. Um, we're trying to solve some of those questions at Edge Impulse, and it's, it's pretty challenging stuff. Um, cool. So. Um, Another question similar, uh, kind of, it's about um, how do you get your models efficiently to the device? So it's sort of the inverse, like has there been research done about how to efficiently send models down the wire? Um, and like, uh, is stuff like MLIR relevant? Um, yeah, so to take the, the first question about model deployment, um, one of the things I really like about TinyML is that it's, you really don't need a network connection um, to do some useful stuff. And you definitely don't need kind of an, you know, an always on. Um, you, you can kind of think about what you're building with at TinyML as kind of a standalone sensor. Like just like you have a temperature sensor or a pressure sensor, you have a, is there a person here sensor? Um, so I actually often uh, encourage people to kind of forget about the fact you have a network connection and just try and build something that you deploy like a standard sensor without doing updating. Um, just because that makes things like security and everything else so much, um, so much easier. Um, now, if you are looking at deploying, um, one of the nice things about TF Flight Micro is that you can update the model and have the code section remain the same. So you can just kind of overwrite a data area in your flash that has the model. And then next time you run that model, it will actually um, work uh, just kind of uh, using that new model. Um, but we don't have anything particular for compressing it over the wire or anything like that. Um, that's, uh, that's kind of outside of our uh, wheelhouse. So. Cool, thanks. Um, so um, quick question about uh, performance. So there are a few questions that I'm going to merge into one. It's really about um, for these types of applications um, that we've discussed, so like maybe vision or audio detection, um, what rate, what type of latency are we going to see when we're running in inference? How long will it take to run one inference? And um, what does the workload look like for trying to classify like if audio events or trying to classify image, can we do video or is this still images? Yeah, that's, um, so the audio side, um, I think that there's, there's a whole like spectrum of uh, different use cases. Probably one of the simplest is the, um, like the accelerometer um, that I was talking about with the magic wand, because you might only have like a 25 kilohertz uh, sorry, 25 hertz sampling rate. So you're only getting 25 XYZ samples every second. 
Um, and you're running a model that might only have a few thousand parameters and a few tens of thousands of um, arithmetic operations to implement it. Um, so that can really run in, you know, sub one millisecond um, fairly easily. Um, you know, you can sort of do the math yourself. If, it, if it's taking, you know, 100,000, 10,000 or 100,000 operations and you're running on a chip that's, you know, running at, you know, 40 megahertz, so it can do 40 million a second, um, then hopefully you're going to be running in the, you know, milliseconds. Um, and audio is kind of a step up from accelerometer normally because you're doing like 16 kilohertz and then you're doing usually feature engineering to kind of pull out a spectrogram from the audio. And then you're running a larger model that's got sort of maybe a few, you know, a couple of hundred thousand arithmetic operations. So that might take sort of, you know, three or four milliseconds. And then once you get to running on a, you know, on a 96 by 96 image and doing image classification, um, that can easily be um, many tens of millions of operations. Um, so if you're running at like 40, 40 or 50 megahertz, um, then that's going to take, um, you know, at least a couple of seconds per frame, maybe for that. Um, there's lots of things you can do with accelerators and things like that, but that maybe gives you like a, an order of magnitude idea of what the performance is likely to be on existing hardware. Perfect. Thanks, Pete. Um, so, and actually sort of comes to mind that our ARM have this new um, architecture that's been announced that's maybe going to make a, a bit of a, a move in the needle there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is what we find is that our product, the product teams we work with, if they had more ML compute, they could come up with new features or even entirely new products. So that's why I've been excited to see accelerators like ARMS um, coming onto the market is because we do have product teams who are blocked on being able to, you know, they, they would run more advanced models, they do more stuff if they had more ML compute. Cool, so I just want to check that you're still good on time. Um, we have an endless list of questions here. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think I'm going to have to jump onto the forum and uh, yeah, I think, I think maybe we should uh, continue it there. Uh, you know, feel free to ping me on Twitter as well. Um, but uh, yeah, no, this, is, this has been fantastic. I want to thank everybody um, for um, you know, spending this time uh, when so much else is going on. <laughs> Uh, to dive into this. It's been really great hearing all your questions. And thanks, Dan and Iron and Evgeny and everybody for hosting. Yeah, and thank you so much, Pete. Um, we couldn't have hoped for a, a better kickoff to our series of talks. And um, yeah, to everyone who's listening, please tune in next time. It's on April 14th. Um, this video and the slides will be posted on YouTube and on the forum. Um, and we'll be hanging out on the forum um, today. So uh, if you, you have any further questions, please drop in there and I'll try and answer all the questions that are in the QA, at least to some extent. Um, there are 59 of them still open, so there's a lot of interest here. Um, so thank you so much again, Pete. This was fantastic and, and really grateful for you sharing your time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.